are investigating reports of additional we have no confirmation that that actually indeed played out. It's, it's the kind of thing you do have to investigate and the kind of thing you hear yes. in the midst of chaos. Yes, these secondary and tertiary calls that something else is happening is quite common when you have a critical incident happening. Your response, if it is true, is there to protect as many people as possible. We are hearing at this hour that the we gathered that the White House was told immediately uh, by Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, Lisa Monaco. Uh, she filled him in on the shooting, what we know so far about what's transpired. On here, we also know that Tower this afternoon. Uh, he was set to meet with the heads of the CIA, the FBI, and other intelligence agencies. Uh, obviously, they had other issues to discuss, but certainly this will come up. And this is, uh, I believe, one of the, the first, if not the first, uh, domestic incident that Donald Trump, uh, even though he's not been inaugurated yet, he is just days away from becoming uh, the 45th president. And this will be, uh, this will be the kind of scene, unfortunately, that he will now have to preside over in culmination. He'll be tested in many ways, but two weeks before the inaugural, this, this sort of thing is exactly what uh, U.S. officials fear. They have yet places where people uh, don't have weapons, there is no security, and if it's not the uh, uh, baggage claim area of Terminal 2 in Fort Lauderdale, uh, it could be a nightclub in Paris or any sort of thing where people are exposed and there's no security. And as you say, David, as we've been talking all, all afternoon here, there is no way to protect every single place. There really isn't. And, and this is a debate that we've had in this country since 9-11. And uh, we mentioned it earlier on in our coverage that you understand, particularly around the holidays, the frustration of people who end up waiting in these lines that can be hours long. You had the computer meltdown uh, with people coming back into the country over New Year's. Uh, waiting for hours and hours. Many of them missed flights and then were waiting at airports a full 24 hours before they were able to get on flights. But all of this is tied to this post 9-11 security world. And when you see an incident like this, you're reminded of why we have, we're talking about the ticketing areas and the baggage claim areas. Yeah, there's actually a lot of talk among the experts who look at this kind of airport security situation, who think it's time to move security farther back from TSA, at least to the front doors. And we're talking the front doors of the ticket, uh, where do you get your ticket, or at baggage claim. Um, that's very expensive. Who's going to pay for it? Is the federal government going to pay for it? The airports would probably have to pay for it. The airlines are concerned about making uh, travel by air any more of a hassle than it already is for their passengers. But it's this debate we've had, and it's, it's gotten heated and more attention since we've had the issues in Istanbul, the issues that we've had bringing the security out to make them more. It's the same reason that malls are a concern for law enforcement as well. Wherever large number of people are gathered, it could be a target for somebody with a weapon. That's the area you're concerned about. David Curley, thank you. David Curley, who covers aviation. These are live pictures from WPLG in Miami, our affiliate uh, in the region. You saw the heavy presence there already, law enforcement on the scene, uh, someone walking the, uh, near the parking garage, it would appear, uh, right there. We heard from Senator Bill Nelson of Florida earlier uh, in our live coverage who told us that they had already increased what he called uh, Viper teams, teams including dogs, canines at the airport. Uh, David Curley now just telling us about the debate about whether or not to move security uh, back even further uh, so that, that you would see security even from the moment you walk into those ticketing areas and, and, and much earlier than perhaps that TSA security line that you get into. These are pictures from earlier, they're running around. But you can see that they're going uh, from which we were seeing moments ago too, but these are live pictures heard from an eyewitness who was on the phone as it happened to her. Uh, she sounds somewhat frightened by it, uh, but hopefully she figured out pretty quickly that this is part of what they have to do. I will say this though, the Broward uh, Sheriff's Department has now tweeted, and we were being very careful with this information about reports of possible additional shots being fired in other terminals. Uh, the Broward sheriffs have now tweeted that there are, in fact, unconfirmed reports of additional shots fired on airport property. Uh, it was two other terminals and the parking garage, which would explain why we're looking at live pictures right now of, of, of a very tense scene. Security is back with us. I mentioned Diane earlier. Diane was inside the airport. First of all, Diane, we just want to make sure you were okay because you, you apologized, said you yeah. had to get off the phone when authorities were coming through. They were sweeping the terminal? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, they were patting us down. 
they patted you down? They went from passenger to passenger? Yes. Passenger patted everybody down. And did they talk to you while they did that? Were they explaining that no. that's what they have to do? No. 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 They just told us, stand there, and we were going to pat it down. And certainly you understand yeah. why. Oh, I, I understand. I understand where, as I said, um, you know, it is just, as I said, when you see, you know, that's like in the movies. I was behind the kiosk. I had a perfect picture of him coming and walking up and down, shooting the people. I, I mean, I just can't believe that that was possible. So, Diane, you were at a kiosk in what part of the airport when you first saw him? Were you in the baggage um, claim area? Where were you? Yes, that's where he shot, in the baggage claim. He shot everybody between two and three. Between two and three, meaning? The carousels. Oh, between carousels two and three. And you, had you come in on a flight? Is that why you were at baggage claim? No, no, I worked work there. Oh, you worked? I, I worked for a cruise line, mm -hmm. and I was standing on the kiosk. We heard the noise, and all we heard, we thought it was, um, we thought it was firecrackers that wise kids were doing. And then we looked again, because I know where we came in, and we looked again, and we saw him with the gun going up and down. Yeah. We all realized then. <laughs> I finally was able to get out. And you and you left the terminal altogether, or did you go to another terminal? Yes. Where are you now? Yes. I, you know, I, so we came back, and we also had people to take care of. So had people to take care of. And Diane, unfortunately, what you describe is what we've heard so often. Is that initially people think it's firecrackers or something being set up? By... Yes, it, it, it sounded like it just sounded like that, and we all looked down to where it was coming from. And the only thing we can figure out is that he was shooting up in the beginning because then when he got in the thing, he did nothing but swing the gun and shoot. Diane, can you describe what you what you were able to see? Were you able to see him directly? We have reports that he was wearing a uniform, that he was carrying some sort of a long gun. What what did you see? I didn't see a long gun. I saw a short gun, and um, he had on a bluish green shirt. Um, and I would say it was not too old. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, he wasn't 50 or 60. He, I would say, was probably 30. But no, um, as I said, I watched him, and I can't believe I watched him. Was he saying anything as he was doing this? No, no, not that I heard. Way. Diane Haggerty with us on the phone. Diane works at a kiosk there for one of the cruise lines. We're all familiar that when you come through uh, the terminal after you've gotten off your flight and you come to get your bags, uh, they're often the very kind faces waiting to greet you from various uh, different businesses, the rental agencies and the cruise lines, and Diane was there. Uh, Diane, we thank you. We're glad you're okay. And she described a scene of people who initially heard, you know, cracking, you know, they didn't know whether they were dealing with, you know, firecrackers or she said teenagers maybe acting up inside the airport. Uh, but it was not long before she said she actually saw the shooter herself. Uh, as is so often the case, eyewitnesses describing slightly different descriptions of uh, who they saw in those initial moments. She said it appeared that he had a short gun, uh, that he was wearing a, a, a blue or green uh, shirt. Um, and she didn't describe a uniform uh, per se. She also said he wasn't saying anything unless he was whispering something under, uh, under his breath and that she just dove behind the desk of the kiosk uh, until the situation had cleared somewhat and then she left altogether. Um, also when they came through with the second sweep uh, and she described a scene inside the terminal where they were patting everyone down, authorities not even uh, talking to them. Just I want to get back to what we heard from Senator Bill Nelson before. Uh, who was joining us live, uh, and he had a military ID. Uh, he attached a name to it, and we, we, we do this with care, but, but he did, did say the name so far attached to that military ID is Esteban Santiago. And Brian, stick with me here. Uh, for those of you just tuning in, 3 o'clock here in the East Coast, you're watching ABC News live coverage of the scene unfolding at Fort Lauderdale Airport this afternoon. Uh, a lone gunman, it's believed at this point that it was a lone gunman, walked into Terminal 2, the baggage claim, opening fire. At least five people were killed right there on the scene. Uh, it's believed at this point eight people uh, are injured, uh, were killed dead. We knew early on from the, the Broward County Sheriff Department that they did believe they were dealing with that number is five people dead. Uh, the cracking noise, the crackling noise of the gunfire, uh, and, and the, the fact that workers who stood there and watched this unfold 
uh, in horror and disbelief when they saw the gunmen for themselves and had to dive behind the kiosks right there in the baggage claim. I'm joined by our chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross, who's been uh, you know, here with me on the desk now for a couple of hours after we first learned uh, of this unfolding situation. And as I was mentioning, Senator Nelson on the phone, this was, this was reporting that we had not heard yet, but he, he'd been told by authorities right away that the suspect being led away, and we had an image of that, unclear if that's the actual suspect, but someone being led away, had a military ID on them and that the name associated with it he'd been told was Esteban Santiago. That's right and uh, federal law enforcement authorities and aviation security officials have told us that is the name they are working in now a as the possible shooter. Uh, you want to caution that sometimes people end up with the ID of somebody else. If that is the name he is a 26 year old male uh, born in New Jersey uh, with addresses going back to Anchorage, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And again, we caution that this is just initial reporting attached to the name that we had been given by uh, Senator Nelson. Now federal authorities saying that that is in fact the name that at least early on they're going with and now investigating. But that's early word coming in on, on the individual we might be looking at. We certainly do not know if that's indeed the person because as you point out uh, and smartly is that as a, as a way to throw away. But it's clear from what we're seeing in these pictures, David, uh, that scene is not cleared. They have not cleared that scene. Chief Brown, when you look at these pictures and, and how intense the scene still is, as some of these pictures come in now, people down, um, some frantic. This is what happens when you have additional further incidents being being reported. And that's often the case after an incident, given the chaos. And, and we heard of the shouting and the screaming people so concerned. Yes, the anxiety levels of people when you have these type of incidents just raises to the highest level. And any loud noise from here forward throughout the day Will cause reactions like this where people just will start running when they hear a loud bang or a scaffold fall or some worker maybe drops something it makes just a loud banging noise it creates this and it also could be other co-conspirators with this situation uh and another active shooter so you can't eliminate anything now and, and, and people pretty much their psychology of i'm not safe in this area it, it causes you to run and do things hunker down, and law enforcement have to react to these types of uh, witness accounts that they heard a loud noise, they thought it might be shooting. And so you have to treat them all as if they're uh, real critical incidents happening uh, throughout the day. And I want to get back to Pierre Thomas, Chief Brown, who's with us. Uh, he's our senior justice correspondent because, Pierre, you're here learning something uh, new from your sources. I spoke to, had that name. Uh, that Senator Nelson uh, gave us on our air, but the source was cautioning your time, make sure that the person that you have in custody is uh, actually the person that, uh, from the ID that you're looking in. And uh, two sources are now emphasizing that so far, they have not been given any clear uh, idea on what the motive uh, for the shooting was. And again, these are people directly communicating with folks down uh, in Florida. So it's still a very fluid situation. Uh, they're being very careful uh, to try to meticulously go through uh, this investigation, uh, run down this name. Again, there will be multiple people with that, that sort of name. So as you can imagine, David, it will take some time to make sure that they have the actual person uh, that uh, uh, they can make sure that they're looking at the actual shooter, know exactly who that person is and their complete background. The FBI, uh, Homeland Security, uh, Secret Service, uh, multiple law enforcement agencies checking uh, their uh, databases to see what they can find out uh, about this particular name. Again, trying to match it with the individual in custody. Yeah, excusing extreme care in investigating the name, federal sources are telling us, which is why we are being careful. Of course, that name is just one of the early suspects, but as Brian Ross pointed out earlier, so as is often the case, sometimes these military IDs are are stolen or purposely meant to throw off law enforcement in the early hours after an incident like this. I want to bring in our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz, who's uh, reported extensively on the military for, for many, many years. And, and Martha, I know the reaction almost immediately when we hear about a military ID is, is, a, is a difficult one because these are the, you know, the men and women who, who serve this country and put their lives on the line and all over the world. And, and when we hear that, that it could be a member of the military who could be involved in this, uh, it's a difficult, it's a difficult headline.
Uh, it certainly is, David. It's something we're looking into. We're trying to find out more about this name from the Pentagon. They haven't confirmed anything yet, and as we've been reporting all afternoon, we haven't confirmed that that's actual is the ID that the suspect had on his person. You can also get a military ID, by the way, if you are a dependent or a spouse of someone in the military. Uh, a dependent, certainly you'd be under a certain age. Uh, but one thing about a military ID, if in fact this person is in the military and we don't know what branch of, of service he may be in, is that he would have weapons training. Everyone in the military has some sort of weapons training, and there are refresher courses certainly throughout the career. There are not many military bases around Fort Lauderdale Airport. Uh, there are some reserve bases uh, fairly nearby, 50, 60, 70 miles away, but any major air bases or any sort of military bases are quite a distance away from there. Martha, thank you. I do want to bring in Steve Campion. He's with our ABC station in Houston, KTRK. He was on the flight from Houston to Fort Lauderdale, landed at the airport. They kept him on the plane for some time. And Steve, when we last spoke with you, uh, we could hear the flight crew in the background beginning to tell you that they were going to allow all of you, the passengers on the plane, to, to get off our luggage. And they let us come off the plane through the gate, but not into the... To you. Uh, Steve Campion standing on, uh, on the tarmac. I want to bring in Mark Lee another eyewitness uh, who's with us. And, and Mark, what can you tell us you saw? Um, they say I was on the far end of the baggage claim terminal. Um, we first kind of heard what sounded like firecrackers going off, a quick round of three. Um, when we kind of realized it was not firecrackers, after more shots continued to go off, um, we realized that there was an active shooter in the building. Um, people started yelling and screaming, frantically running towards any door exit to get out of there. Uh, for things so I can help get a number of people out of there and get some other people to safety. Um, after I helped a couple of ladies that had fallen down as they were trying to get out of the door, I actually ran back in and continued to help people get out and um, kind of continue to make my way actually even closer to the shooter, which doesn't make sense, but trying to help some people and get them more secure. Uh, from there, by the time, um, like I say, he went, basically had a nine millimeter gun, uh, went through probably at least a couple dozen rounds. Uh, by the time he was done, done shooting there, he was basically threw the gun down on the ground and uh, basically was laying spread eagle face down on the ground um, before even before any officers were really even much in the area whatsoever um, from there. Can so you, he, you, he had just, no intention of running out of the building. That's the first time we've heard a description like that. So again, you say it, it, it would appear that he was using a 9 millimeter gun. He'd opened yep, fire in the terminal and then yep. he, he was down on the ground? No, no, no. He basically, once he walked in the terminal, he came through door two, he went towards the right, so going towards carousel two and three, and just started randomly shooting people at that will. I mean, no, no rhyme, no reason. He wasn't targeting male or female or any of that point. He was, I mean, there was, you know, like a, a gentleman with his two boys, he got shot in the wrist. There's a lady I was consoling for quite a while that her husband was, was one of them that was killed here, was shot in the head. Um, that, you know, she got shot in the neck um, through and through. Um, I watched you know, I just, you know, the other couple of people that were killed here. I watched in such in about roughly 45 seconds. 40. Yeah, I watched them. I was, at that point, I was about probably 20 feet away from him by that time. And, and so how, did, he, how, how uh, was he detained? Uh, he basically, once, once, he was done, once he was done with ammunition, I thought a gun, he threw his gun down the road, which I was about 10 feet away from him. Um, and... Uh, he uh, basically threw the gun on the ground, and he and he laid on the ground, face down, spread eagle. So yeah, so he was already down. He was waiting for the officer to approach him. That's what I was getting at earlier. We had not heard that uh, description yet. Uh, Mark Lee, who's yeah. inside the terminal, Mark, we we really appreciate uh, you talking with us, and and you're very calm for having just helped so many people in in in, in the middle of that storm. But and women, he said, um, and this eyewitness says when the shooting had uh, was finished that he was standing a mere 10 feet away from the gunman, who he said appeared to have run out of ammunition, uh, was then on the ground, face down, uh, laying down on the ground. Uh, and he said, in fact, he was there lying on the ground waiting for uh, law enforcement when they finally get on the scene, Brian. That's right, and we're getting a second report that it was a handgun that was used, uh, not a uh, long rifle, not a semi-automatic uh, weapon. This is different, though, from what we have seen in the past as far as him um, appearing to be finished with what he could do and then simply waiting for authorities to arrive. Right. That is not how a, a suicide-inspired uh, attacker behaves. This, this appears to be something different from early indications, and we're told that he is in custody and uh, he is talking with authorities now.
And what we don't know, obviously, at this point was whether or not he had more weaponry, more ammunition, just could use it, or if he simply walked in, used what he had, and, and then was finished with the, with the terror he was inflicting on the people uh, inside that airport. For those of you uh, tuning in in the last 15 minutes or so, we've been on the air all afternoon. You're watching live coverage here on ABC. These are uh, pictures coming in from Fort Lauderdale at this hour. After a shooting early this afternoon inside Terminal 2, the baggage claim, the people you're looking at there are on the perimeter of the following the incident and also uh, as authorities work to either knock down or confirm reports that perhaps there might have been additional reports of, of shootings in different terminals and in, and in the Broward County Sheriff's Department was trying to get to the bottom of, uh, had tweeted out uh, some time ago about unconfirmed reports that there were additional incidents. They have not confirmed that that's the case. Uh, but as we've been reporting all afternoon, in the chaos that follows, and we've heard from eyewitnesses who heard uh, people screaming and running from the scene saying shooting, shooting, that there is often confusion and can lead to uh, early reports of additional uh, incidents uh, in or around the airport. So that's what they're doing right now. They continue to do the sweep. Live pictures a short time ago showed them walking up the stairwell, uh, heavily armed as they make their way through the airport. One of the eyewitnesses on the phone with us, in fact, was talking to me, and she had to get off the phone because they were patting down the passengers uh, one by one going through the terminal, uh, every inch of that airport at this hour, uh, doing what we often see uh, after a deadly incident uh, like this one. We heard from Diane Haggerty, who works at one of the kiosks uh, in the baggage terminal. She'd gone back in uh, because she had left her belongings and, and her co co-workers at the other um, you know, counters and, and kiosks that were there. Um, I do want to let people know, loved ones, I'm sure, and people who work there, that at the very least, we have heard from Delta. Uh, they have put out a statement. They fly out of Terminal 2, which is where this all transpired in Fort Lauderdale. And, and they're now reporting that preliminary reports indicate that all Delta employees are, in fact, safe and accounted for uh, during what remains an ongoing uh, incident at the Fort Lauderdale airport. So again, Delta has put out word that their employees are safe and accounted for. And that's certainly good news. I wish we could tell everyone about uh, their loved ones, but as this continues to unfold, we'll get the information that almost immediately uh, after uh, taking this lone gunman, it's believed to be a lone gunman, one shooter into custody, that they almost immediately found a military ID. Uh, and Brian Ross, our chief investigative correspondent, and his team has been looking into uh, what matches up with that ID, although you're doing it with extreme caution because in these cases we often find that the first name uh, or the first ID isn't always the, the ID that actually matches the person. Or a relative, it could be anything, seem to have made a match, uh, according to what we're being told now, between that name and, and this suspect. And of course, if he was in the military, there will be uh, fingerprint records, which can be rather rapidly checked. The fingerprints will certainly help, because when you have a name like Esteban Santiago, that is, that is a name that's going to turn up over and over again. There are a lot of people That's out a common there. name, exactly. So we have to be very, very careful as we move forward. And again, it's only a name and we don't know whether it's the, the actual name they will connect with the person that they've taken away from the scene. I, I do want to uh, get back to an image that was shared with us if we, if we still have the passengers or people in the airport who'd been hit, only endured and what people witnessed. This was captured by an eyewitness who told me uh, that he was looking out through that window and that this was one of the people uh, who was still alive when they pulled him out. Um, of the terminal. He was in the baggage claim area, was still alive when he captured this image. Uh, and obviously we're all hoping that, that he, he's been able to uh, survive this and has pulled through. But that just illustrates not only what people endured, um, the, the victims in this case, but also the families who were right there and witnessed this whole thing transpire right there in front of them. Steve Campion, KTRK reporter who was on that flight uh, from Houston to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, he was on that flight. We were talking with him. We could hear the flight crew beginning to tell the passengers that they, too, would be deplaning like the hundreds of other people that Steve was able to see out the window while he was on the plane. And, Steve, uh, I had to step away from you for just a moment, but I do want to get back to you because you're now down with so many people who are simply standing outside that airport. David, correct. It's incredible at the airport, especially everyone on our flight. They simply did not know what was happening. Um, here at the airport, except when obviously everyone turned on their phones, phones started going off with calls. But I'm actually on the runway with hundreds of people who are being kept outside of the terminal, but in the secure area of the runway where the planes typically would be taxiing and then taking off. Um, we can hear in the distance the alarm system in the terminal going off as the sheriff's helicopter hovers overhead. So many people out here simply do not know what happened. 
earlier today. They are they are calling their loved ones. Everyone we're being told uh, coming into the airport is being diverted. So everyone is essentially out here on the one runway sitting and waiting to see what will happen. David, it's hard to gauge. I would say where I am on this part of the runway, there are hundreds of people out here. Um, it, it's just simply hard to count. But again, I can't see uh, the entire the entire airport at this point. We are really in one section of it. Just you know, walked, I'm sure, to some of those secure locations. As far as the police activity at this point, uh, Steve, we've been told by the Broward Sheriff's Department that there were unconfirmed reports of possible additional shots fired. They haven't weighed in. We're expecting a briefing in a moment, and when we get that briefing, we should let everyone at home know that we will obviously carry that live. But in the meantime, Steve, what have you been able to witness as far as ongoing police activity there at the airport? I can tell you where I am standing, the police are off in the distance. This area is kind of being taken care of for by airline personnel, TSA. We have some of the airline employees out here actually passing out that water to, to people just sitting here waiting. So we haven't really had an interaction with law enforcement here on the ground in this particular part of the airport where we're standing. All right. That's Steve Fort there in Fort Lauderdale where he landed only to learn of the situation. And he described, which is uh, a common part of the culture now of flying, that when you land Chief Brown, you turn back on your phone when they tell you you can. And he said almost immediately the phones were lighting up with certainly loved ones who were checking on everyone landing on that flight to Fort Lauderdale. Yes, very common for everyone with their smartphone to take images, talk to loved ones, take pictures. Some people even maybe be Facebook Live, some information that they tell their loved ones what they saw. And, and so we will have a lot of uh, flow of information back and forth over the next several hours about what exactly happened from different perspectives based on witness eyewitness accounts. And you heard from Diane Haggerty, that eyewitness who, who calmly talked to us, even Diane knew that when the authorities came back through and they began patting everyone down, that this is part of what you expect to see. Uh, our new normal is, is what I call it, what a lot of people in the profession call it. When we have active shooters, a lot of people around, you get this type of response from citizens. As I mentioned a moment ago, we we're expecting to hear from authorities who are on the scene. We know that when uh, they begin to carry that lie, we will turn right to it as we wait for more information. But many of you, I know, have been with us all afternoon. For those of you who are uh, perhaps getting home from work and now just joining our live coverage, I want to bring you up to speed on what we've witnessed uh, transpiring in Fort Lauderdale uh, this afternoon. Early this afternoon, we learned of shots fired at the Fort Lauderdale airport. And it was a short time after we came on the air that we learned that at least five people were shot and killed inside Terminal 2 at Fort Lauderdale Airport. One witness describing the gunman walking into that baggage claim area and turning right as soon as they walked in through that door. They were simply firecrackers at first uh, until they were able to actually lay eyes on the gunman. Then they realized what they were dealing with and unfolding uh, a scene of terror. Uh, as the gunman shot men and women. Uh, one witness by the name of Mark Lee, I believe. And in something Mark on the phone was that the gunman fired, he says, uh, he believes, until he simply ran out of uh, ammunition and then just, uh, he said he went down onto the floor, face down, and was lying on the floor until law enforcement could come into the term he hadn't heard before. Uh, and, and certainly is something rare about this particular scene. And Brian Ross, you've learned more about the investigation into who this might be. It's a rapidly unfolding new information from a Broward County commissioner and a senior aviation security official reporting uh, that uh, Santiago arrived on a flight from Canada, had a gun checked in his baggage, uh, took it out upon his arrival, and then began the shooting. So this would appear uh, to be someone who had flown into Fort Lauderdale. According to this information from the Brownie, uh, a Broward County Commissioner and a second uh, source who is a senior aviation security official, uh, both uh, providing that information at this point, confirmed with a gun uh, checked in his luggage. If in fact that's true, that would change this uh, significantly because we've been talking about soft targets, whether or not there should be additional security at the ticketing counters and in the baggage claim areas, and whether or not this was someone who simply showed up like we saw in Istanbul and in Brussels. If this is in fact somebody who flew into that airport, it changes the dynamic of what unfolded there uh, today. I want to bring in uh, Dwayne Dickerson. Uh, he is being held inside the airport. Uh, I gather, Dwayne, they're holding a number of people just to keep everybody safe there. But what can you describe as far as what you saw, what you heard there today? Good afternoon. I was in line. I was next in line to check my bag in ticketing, uh, Terminal 2, Delta. And we heard this loud bang. And there was a second loud bang. And then there was just rapid bang.
bang, bang, bang. And we knew, we knew somebody was shooting and there was mass hysteria. And so I jumped over the ticketing counter and, and I asked the Delta representative, I said, where's an exit? We need to get out of here. They're shooting. Where's an exit? And she was just frozen. She was mortified. And so I kept asking her, you know, and I grabbed her hand and tried to like pull her, like, what, show me where the exit is. And she, and, and so then we saw this door um, right off to the side of ticketing and we thought that was an exit. So everybody started cramming in there. Well, it's, it's a supply closet that's no bigger than the smallest hotel room. And so we were holed up in there, uh, but we, you know, we eventually we started peeking our head out because nobody wanted to be stuck in here with one way in and one way out with a shooter that can come in here. So, uh, like things calmed down about 30, 45 minutes later. So people started coming out of the closet and then we see the police running and shouting again. Um, and then there's a message over the intercom that says, um, shelter in place and remain calm. Remain calm, so, shelter so in now, place. Dwayne, she, stick, with place stick with us here. Stick with us here, Dwayne. We want to, we want to turn to the sheriff right now, briefing reporters. Let's listen in. Scott Israel is the sheriff. Federal Bureau of Investigation. Shortly before 1 p.m. today, we had an active shooter inside Terminal 2, the lower level by baggage. Uh, the active shooter shot at least 13 people. Eight people, as I know right now, are in area hospitals being treated. I don't know the degree of their injuries. Uh, five people have succumbed to their wounds and tragically are, are dead. Um, we are not releasing any information on any of the victims until we identify them, which is going to take some time, and we are able to respectfully notify the next of kin first. Um, the, uh, the investigation continues. We have area SWAT teams and the Broward Sheriff's Office SWAT team clearing the entire airport. Uh, there'll be no movement in or about the airport until our SWAT team scene is considered fluid and active. Uh, we won't be, um, well, we have uh, one of the more critical pieces of information is we have uh, the shooter in custody. Uh, he's uh, unharmed. No law enforcement fired any shots. The subject is being interviewed by a team of FBI agents and Broward Sheriff's Office homicide detectives. There's been incredible cohesiveness and cooperation between the Broward Sheriff's Office, the FBI, FDLE, and all the local uh, law enforcement entities. Uh, we'll answer your questions at the end. We'll answer your questions at the end. At this point, I'm going to uh, put the uh, uh, director of the airport on to tell you about what's going on at the airport. Then you'll be hearing from the SAC, Mr. Piero. Then I'll come back to answer questions. Thank you, Director, here at the Fort Lauderdale International Airport. Uh, when the incident occurred, uh, we responded. Uh, many of you know that we've uh, suspended operations at the airport for the time being. We're working together with all the law enforcement uh, to address uh, all the needs and concerns of the passengers that are inside the building and on airplanes right now, they are all sheltered in place. Uh, we're not sure exactly when the airport will reopen for operations. We're going to work together with all the law enforcement that's here, our airlines, and all the other agencies uh, before we actually move to reopen up the airport. But in the meantime, as, as the sheriff has indicated, we're just going to go step by step, methodically through the building uh, before we take any steps to reopen operations. Uh, families or friends that may be looking for folks that they haven't been able to reach in contact with, and we'll also publish that uh, in the relatively near future, uh, again, on our hop site and out through a uh, website and through social media. And that's all I have for now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is George Pierre. I'm the special agent in charge of the FBI's Miami field office. As the sheriff mentioned, the FBI is working very closely with the Broward Sheriff's Office, uh, supporting their ongoing efforts here at the airport. We're working jointly doing all of the uh, uh, witness interviews as well as the uh, suspect interview. Uh, the investigation is very early. We have a lot of preliminary information that we are going through, uh, but at this point our role is to actively support the Broward Sheriff's Office uh, until we make a determination on the nature and the motive of this incident. Thank you. We, we've heard about a shooting in, in Terminal 1. What can you tell us about that? Just refer to the camera. At, at this time, there's no, uh, there's been no shooting in any place else but at the downstairs of Terminal 2. There's no confirmation of any shooting. As a matter of fact, at this point as I speak, the only gunshots fired at any time during this horrific incident have been downstairs in Terminal 2. What happened? It's like somebody got injured evacuating, nothing to do with any type of uh, gunshot or anything like that. And the evacuation. Our, uh, 
truck, light truck operator heard shots after the initial lone uh, shooter at the other terminal. He heard shots directly behind him inside the parking lot. We have no confirmation at that. We have law enforcement personnel, both federal, state, and local throughout the airport. No law enforcement this time has confirmed that there's been any gunshots other than was fired in Terminal 2. We also saw someone being arrested. Is there another person possibly involved? Uh, not in the shooting aspect of it. We're reviewing tapes. If, uh, if someone was arrested, it, it might be for a, a plethora of things. But to my knowledge, no one was taken into custody. People could have been secured in handcuffs until we found out who they were, what they were, and how they were related or not related to this scenario. So I don't know if they were physically arrested or not. Did but the shooting no happen at the gate? Color. At the gate? Or happened around the baggage area. The baggage Any information as to why? One suspect only in custody. We're not releasing any information on that suspect. Yes, sir. Are you able to say what kind of weapon was used in the shooting no. terminal tomb? No. No. Was, was it an automatic? Was it a semi-automatic? We're, we're not going to comment. Uh, to Does it appear that the shooter was waiting for somebody to arrive and go to baggage and then ambush them? We're at the very beginning of the investigative stages. That's what this is all about. That's why uh, uh, at this point, the lead on the investigation is with the Broward Sheriff's Office. If we do uncover it sometime, that this was related to any type of terrorist or, or terrorist activities, then the FBI will have complete incident command of this and uh, we'll be assisting the FBI as we move forward with the investigation. Uh, I'll also, I want to say uh, this is not the time for anybody to call 911 on this incident. We're all over here. Uh, if you have a real emergency, of course, but if it has involved you, uh, please keep the 911 lines open. And if you need information, you can follow us on Twitter uh, at Sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. Do you believe he acted alone? At Broward. At the airport that went along Not at this time, not to my knowledge. So at this point there doesn't appear to be a terrorism indication at all or too early? No, it's too early to say either way on that. That's what that's what's going on right now. The baggage area where they were coming from, where were those uh, people coming from? Where were they? Do you know? What flight were they? I do know. Package. I do know what flight, but we're not releasing any information until we can positively identify the kid. Can we won't be giving up. No. Can you tell us if the victims were men, women, or children? No, we're not going to. Do you think this guy acted alone? At this point, it looks like he acted alone. Were they part of a family? Yes. There, there's. There's no act. There's no, at this point, there's no second active shooter. There are no victims suffering for any gunshot wounds. We heard that information as well. It's, it's, it's not confirmed. And right now we're dealing with this incident right here. Can you tell us what was going on in the parking garage that had the agents gun drawn, ready to go into, you know, looking for something? I'm, I'm sure they were looking for, you know, clearing parking lots. Uh, we have a variety of SWAT teams out and assets out clearing uh, the entire airport to make sure it's safe. So just doing their job, working very hard and diligently. Oh, was the shooter in this uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's Friday afternoon. I mean, about how busy was the airport? Is this the busiest it is during the week, given that it's Friday afternoon, sort of the height of the tourist season? The airport's always full right now. Uh, our passengers are sheltered in place. We'll be working with law enforcement to actually get them released systematically, as the sheriff has indicated, terminal by terminal, uh, to make sure that folks are able to exit safely as they proceed with their clearing duties. But we're, but sorry. how many people are, are secured either across the runways in the terminal, yeah. on the plane, and the estimates for that? Number? Right now, we actually have everybody in either at the terminals or we've had some airplanes that have landed, uh -huh. that, that we still have airplanes in uh, the terminal building. It's possible that those airplanes may actually depart and not actually come into the terminal building. But on any given day, we typically handle between 80 and 100,000 passengers coming through the facility. So people who are on planes now may not be able to get off? Is that? That's that's a possibility that working with the airlines that some decisions may be made um, that hasn't been confirmed yet that they may actually uh, depart for other cities. Or we're going to go through the terminals uh, again very slowly and methodically to make sure everything is clear uh, before we make any decisions about releasing additional passengers into the building on top of those that are already uh, still in the facility. How many were in that terminal two when you when the shooting? I, had, I don't have that information. Do you know how many were in the baggage area? I don't Hundreds have that information. Or dozens or to anyone count. Where can passengers get that information? We're going to put information out through on our website and also on Twitter at FLL Flyer. Sheriff Israel, can you give us a, a, a timeline? When, to your knowledge, do you know did the shooting begin? How long was the shooter at large? Where was he? Do you see any signs of violence? Do you know how many passengers and where is he being interrogated? As I said before, it happened uh, just before 1 o'clock 
Uh, we're not going to give out any specific information about the logistics. And as I said before, uh, shortly thereafter, almost almost immediately after the shootings. He was apprehended by a Broward Sheriff's deputy, and he was taken into custody without incident. Sheriff, did the gunman check the weapon into his luggage on an Air Canada flight and fly here, land, take the weapon out, go to bathroom and load it? As I said before, that's all part of an ongoing investigation. So we also heard that he put his gun down after the shooting and laid on the floor. I haven't got I haven't gotten that far. Uh, all I know is the, the gunman is in custody. He's being interviewed by the a team of FBI agents and Broward Sheriff's deputies. And at the time, once we establish motive uh, and an investigation continues and we find out what that motive is, then myself and the uh, uh, Mr. Pirro, the director SAC of the FBI, will make a decision as to who takes the lead on the continuing investigation. Sheriff, did you, any of your deputies fire their weapons at, at this parking garage? Is that possibly? Well, uh, gunshot anywhere but at the time of this uh, this horrific, horrific incident. Sheriff, can you say if the guy then was a passing airline passenger, or did he come in at the uh, arrivals area? Uh, we, we, uh, I believe I know that information, but it's not something we're going to release at this time. Can you say where he's being interrogated? Uh, where he is right now? Uh, I'm not sure where he's right now. Sheriff, Sheriff, Sheriff Carl, again, if there was no other viable Sheriff. threat, a second threat, why would the airport be closed after the first person was arrested and being interrogated? Why shut down the airport? As I said, we can't say there's no viable threat. We have to clear the airport. Um, it's it's just a common sense approach. Uh, my concern right now, with, not only with the families of those who lost, but my concern is with the citizens of Broward County. And until myself and the director uh, of the SAC of, of the FBI, until we believe that this airport is a safe place and people can move about, it won't be open. How many to question. Last question. The airport at the time of the shooting? Excuse me. Amy? How many deputies at the airport at the time of the shooting? I'm not sure. Right, Thank you very right. much. Please follow us uh, at the at Broward Sheriff on Twitter. Can, can you just tell what caused the evacuation of Terminal One? Yeah. Briefing. Yeah, again, it's where I, I'm not sure. You've been listening to the Broward County Sheriff's Department and the FBI joining forces there, answering questions about what's transpired in Fort Lauderdale. Those are pictures of people at the perimeter of the airport, and they were explaining just moments ago that this is what they had to do, a standard uh, operating procedure after a deadly incident like what we witnessed early this afternoon in Fort Lauderdale. I'll take you through this if you're tuning in now about what we just heard from authorities there on the scene. The first call came in at around 12.55, shortly before 1.00 of an active shooter. When they arrived on the scene, uh, they saw that the shooter had hit at least 13 people there in Terminal 2, the baggage claim area of the airport. Eight of them are now at area hospitals. Uh, they did not know uh, the extent of their injuries, could not offer that at this time, but eight have been taken to area hospitals. They talked about the five that we have reported on earlier this afternoon, five people dying uh, when that shooter came into Terminal 2, one eyewitness telling me that he walked into the doors, turned right, and then just simply began uh, firing. That shooter is now in custody. Uh, authorities were quick speak. It's something we had talked about, and investigators right there on the ground in, in Broward County. We did listen to them also talking about operations at the airport. We've been reporting this afternoon that operations had come to a halt. Uh, those operations remain suspended. They did say they would alert the public and we'll pass it along to you as soon as operations are back up and running uh, there at the airport. One thing I do want to get to, though, is news that this was someone who flew in on a flight and, and got to Fort Lauderdale. Brian Ross, who had reported this just before we turned to the authorities to get more on this. Uh, and we're learning more about where this gunman might have been flying in from. There were initial reports, perhaps Canada, perhaps Anchorage. Uh, we're still trying to sort that out, but he flew in uh, into, as the uh, sheriff said, he flew in, came in on a flight. The sheriff did not want to identify it, uh, but we have a report. Howard County Commissioner uh, Chip Lamarca, who's been with us this afternoon. And Chip, we appreciate you waiting as we were listening to authorities there. What more can you offer us about where it's believed this gunman might have flown in from? Uh, we've been told he flew in on a uh, flight from Canada. I don't know the uh, the airline or the flight. Uh, it was misreported as Air Canada, so I didn't say that. I just want to make sure that uh, we understand it was from Canada. We understand he had a legally checked gun and went into the bathroom, loaded the gun, and came out and uh, started shooting. We don't know why. It's horrific, and we 
pray for the families of the people that were hurt and killed and uh, also our law enforcement that are there. Uh, but that's that's really all I have at this point. I eight, know- eight, uh, eight people were sent to local uh, hospital, Broward General, our trauma center. Eight people, as you mentioned, at area hospitals, five dying right there on the scene. And uh, Commissioner Lamarco, you mentioned uh, legally checked a uh, loaded gun on that plane. I know there's been some questions about whether or not the flight uh, he was on came in from Canada or from Alaska. Uh, there's going to be continuing reporting on that. But as far as you know at this point, you believe the flight came in from Canada and that when he arrived at the airport, he went into a bathroom and then loaded the gun there? That's what I've been told, yes. Loading the gun in the bathroom before coming out and opening fire. That is that is a new detail that we have yet to report here. Uh, Commissioner, I appreciate that. I do want to bring in uh, David Curley, who covers aviation. He's been with us all afternoon. And David, just remind us, if you would, about the rules about carrying uh, guns on airplanes this court, according to the commissioner. You heard him just moments ago here. And according to TSA rules, if you are flying in the United States, if you are going to an airport, yes, in a hard-cased, plastic, an unloaded weapon, and ammunition in that locked box and check it. Now, it has to be smaller caliber. It can't be anything larger than .75 caliber, no shotgun shells, but small arms ammunition uh, can be loaded with an unloaded weapon in a hard case and checked at an airport, and then you have to tell the folks when you check in at the counter, I have a weapon, it's in this hard case, here it is. You can put a TSA lock on it and TSA will check it. Almost all hard cases are checked by TSA when they are checked, whether or not you say that it has a weapon in it or not. We, we have hard cases when we travel quite a bit, and those are almost always gone through by TSA before they're put on a- uh, with, an, with a legally checked in, um, unloaded gun, uh, it gets checked by TSA, but not the TSA that we're all familiar with when we walk through that line for our carry-on luggage. The- uh, you see them when you're going through the security checkpoint. But in the baggage area, you see the belts go by behind the ca- ticket counter, and those belts carry the luggage sometimes into a basement, depending on the size of the airport. And there are T in the back, in the basement, in the background, when these bags come by, they take them off the belt and they actually go through them. If you've had a bag checked like that, you normally find a piece of paper inside when you arrive at your destination that says the TSA was in that checked piece of baggage and looked at it and then sent it along its way. So perfectly legal, and we just want to reconfirm that that's yeah. what the authorities had said and that it was only when he arrived at the airport that the commissioner then told us moments ago that he went into a bathroom and that's where he loaded the gun. I do want to bring people at home up to speed on something else we've been reporting about because for some time we were still seeing uh, a somewhat frantic scene playing out there in Fort Lauderdale. Look at the, just the sheer number of people. These are images from earlier, but there were hundreds of people down in that tarmac. But for a time, we were watching law enforcement move quickly through the other parts of the airport. There were early reports that there could be possible other incidents at the airport. They, they did knock that down at the briefing just moments ago. They did look into reports, but as we were uh, guessing somewhat earlier that this is uh, typical in scenes like this in the chaos, that you get reports of other things happening, they've been able to confirm at least at this point that there really uh, was no other incident other than the one that we've been reporting on uh, right here for quite some time, since about one o'clock this afternoon. No other gunshots, no one else taken into custody. They are at this point reviewing the the surveillance video and Chief Brown, you're with us as you have been all afternoon and that's one of the first steps they take. Uh, You you can't uh, completely secure these so-called soft areas of the airport, but you certainly can have surveillance going on them 24-7. Right, it's a key security measure to have surveillance video of response to them or it can help your going forward investigative questioning of the suspect on, you know, who were you with? Uh, was there an argument and you can kind of roll back in time and see who this person might have been with and if there was any kind of disturbance prior to things happening. Chief, thank you. I want to turn back to Brian Ross because what we were talking about when we first came on the air were these federal warnings about lone wolves and what we have witnessed um, not too long ago in Istanbul and, and people approaching the ticketing uh, areas uh, and the, the so-called soft areas of the airport. This is different. This is, it would appear, Um, Someone with a military ID who flew into Fort Lauderdale Airport with a legally checked gun in in luggage that would then be checked by the TSA once the ticketing agent marks the bag, sends it down the conveyor belt. Uh, And that it wasn't until he arrived at Fort Lauderdale Airport, got off the plane with everybody else, 
presumably, and then walked into a bathroom, according to the commissioner, and that's where he located. That's right, and I think one of the nuances here, uh, David, and I think Chief Brown will confirm this, that if it was clearly a case of terrorism, the FBI would take over. They would be the lead agency. As the sheriff said, that hasn't been determined yet, and increasingly it's looking like this is not a case of terrorism. We now know that uh, the suspect uh, boarded a plane last night in Anchorage, Alaska, changed planes in Minneapolis, and then flew on into Fort Lauderdale today. So Anchorage, Alaska, changed planes in Minneapolis, and flew to Fort Lauderdale today. That's, that's right. That's the flight. That is the travel path we've now been told by uh, senior officials in Florida. In Long, the information that he'd flown through Canada appears to be updated now. He went from Alaska to Minneapolis. Authorities, you did hear moments ago saying uh, this person did, in fact, act alone. As Brian just mentioned, the FBI would, uh, would move in and quickly if this was determined to be uh, connected to some sort of larger terror plot or had been inspired by some of what we've seen around the world. That does not appear to be the case, uh, at least right now. Um, and we do know that they said there, there, there is no other incident at the airport that they're looking into at this point. Authorities were questioned by reporters there about, I'm sure, uh, the, the fear and, and, and the panic that was being caused by the additional screening that was taking place uh, throughout the airport. But for anyone watching this from home, uh, Chief Brown, the authorities are going to have their sympathy because they said they simply had to do that given the fact that there were other reports of incidents going on and because they wanted to knock down almost immediately any notion that this could be more than just one person. It is a necessary precaution measure that you have to take as law enforcement to treat every uh, call of up people to have higher anxiety uh, seeing cops run. It, it is how you process some of the things that happen after a single critical incident happens with a large crowd and a lot of witnesses. Do we know yet, Brian, why uh, he began in Alaska? Is that where he's from or, or the name at least attached to this military ID? Uh, that pr a person by that name has numerous addresses uh, in, Ac in Anchorage, uh, according to what we've be able to research so far, born in New Jersey in 1990, but with numerous addresses and residences uh, in Anchorage. 1990, that would put him at 26 years old. If That's this right. Is, if this is Birthday indeed, in March, right. Uh, a young man, uh, if this is indeed the correct ID, and of course authorities are looking into that name. We've pointed out a number of times as we've been on the air since about one this afternoon that sometimes initial names do not turn out to be the actual name because people who are involved in these shootings will purposely uh, use the ID of somebody else just to throw off investigators. Though at this point, Brian, and I, I think we can't underscore this enough, that at this point they don't believe there's some sort of larger plot here or someone um, who has you know, pledged allegiance to any of these groups that we've been reporting that, on. Nothing like that at any point so far. And as the sheriff said, there were no other shots fired. Nobody else who apparently did fly in overnight uh, from Alaska and according to the county commissioner uh, had a gun uh, in his baggage. Uh, took it into the uh, restroom and loaded it there and then for whatever reason uh, began to open fire. I want to bring back in Dwayne Dickerson who was uh, describing the scene just when the briefing began and, and Dwayne you, you were calmly talking about what was not uh, a calm scene there in the airport. It leapt behind the counter with the ticketing agent. We can only imagine what that was like and then everyone ran to the doorway. Ended up being a supply closet? That's correct. It was a supply closet smaller than a host, your smallest hotel room. And how long were and, you in, in that room, and, and where are you now? What's the scene? So we were in that room for about 30 minutes. The shooting started around 1, maybe just before 1. We were in that room about 30 minutes. The point is that nobody wanted to be a sitting duck either. You know, it, it was one way in and one way out. And so, you know, it, eventually we started to look like there was a lot of police activity. Then all of a sudden, you hear yelling and screaming, the police officers running, their high-powered rifles up, and that's when these rumors started with the second active shooter. And that's when people poured back into the uh, supply closet, uh, all the kiosks trying to shield themselves from, you know, outside and what seemed to be an active situation outside of the terminal. Law enforcement still keeping people inside the airport there? That, that, that's correct. So uh, the last uh, few announcements, one was... Um, shelter in place and stay calm and then the, the, the very last one was um, do not take any direction from anybody other than law enforcement officers so everybody's in the terminal they're not letting anybody out um, and they're they were asking who saw what and what your account of the situation was so it looks like in one portion of the airport all FBI agents are interviewed that you jump behind the counter with I have not seen her yet.
I have not seen her yet, but she was so she was so scared. She was frozen, David. She she and I was asking us which way to the exit, which way to the exit. And then I saw a door and I said, Was this the exit? And and she she just couldn't she couldn't respond. She was so terrified. And so that's we assume that that may have been the exit and that's when everybody got in there. And so you know, everybody was contemplating, do we want to go in this one place that, hey, so everybody was saying, is there a way out? Is that an exit? Is that an exit? Do we want to go in this one place where we could be trapped? Um, but with so much activity and the shots were still firing, there were several shots. Yeah. It seemed like the best of a bad situation to at least be out of the way. And hopefully he didn't come that way and come in that room. Well, Dwayne, we're glad you're okay and that everybody who was right there with you and that, that Delta agent, I, I hope that she's had some time here. Um, to, to feel a little better about what Thomas. Pierre, take us through the kind of questioning that they're immediately uh, underway with with this suspect. I know that it's a joint, uh, a, a joint effort between local authorities and the FBI uh, underway right now. David, I, I want to pick up on something you had reported earlier from one of the eyewitnesses. Uh, sources are giving me some guidance uh, that one of the things that is very curious to them is how this ended that this source after he was finished shooting laid down on the ground spread eagle and allowed himself to be taken in by law enforcement uh, you saw and heard the, the sheriff uh, uh, from Broward County uh, talk about the fact that the suspect was taken in without uh, incident no shots fired uh, by law enforcement uh, they are very curious about that um, the kinds of questions that they are focusing on, obviously, motive. Why did you do this? Uh, I'm struck by the fact that sources say that they are being so careful that to not to declare this terrorism, not to declare this anything yet until they can get more details uh, from this particular suspect. They just don't know until they can dig into his background. They're planning to talk to everyone who knows this young man to find out everything they can find out about him. They, they will look at his... Uh, smartphone if he has one. They will look at computers. They will look at what he's been viewing online. All those kinds of things things will help them to determine why this person may have done this. And again, the sources are cautioning. They are not going to say what this is until they can do that level of investigation because even what he may say at this point will need to be verified. Right, Pierre. Anything connected to terror would be an immediate shift to the FBI taking over this case. That has not happened, which would indicate at this point that they certainly aren't even close uh, to making that determination. A couple of things I want to point out as everyone's watching our continuing live coverage here. Your local news is coming up shortly, but as we wrap up our coverage, I want to bring you up to speed on the fact that authorities are now looking at a 26-year-old man who perhaps flew from Alaska to Minneapolis, then from Minneapolis to Fort Lauderdale, telling us on our air here a short time ago that then he arrived at the airport, found a bathroom, it's believed it was in that bathroom he loaded that gun. He then went to the baggage area, the baggage claim area of Terminal 2. The pictures right there are from the moments of the aftermath, just moments right after he opened fire. It's been described by multiple witnesses now who were right there in the area that he opened fire indiscriminately, men, women, that there were children in the terminal. We certainly do know that at least five people did die right there on the scene. We also know that when he was done firing the gun, that he lay down spread eagle on the ground and waited for authorities. That is something we haven't reported, a detail that's, uh, that we have not heard in situations like this before. Usually in some of these scenes that we've seen around the world as of late, people often take their own lives before authorities can even get to them. A main difference here in this case is that they have him, they have him alive. Uh, they did not open fire on him. He was already on the ground and waiting when authorities arrived and that will be a key difference in this case, Brian. That's right. Uh, authorities now have confirmed at the Pentagon honorably for our last point of service was Fort Greeley, Alaska, which is outside Fairbanks. So Fort Greeley, Alaska, he was discharged honorably? Honorably discharged about four months ago uh, and had addresses uh, in Alaska and then in Anchorage and flew overnight, uh, boarded the plane last night in Anchorage and as you've reported, flew through Minneapolis to Fort Lauderdale. And again, this was a young man, just 26 years 26 old? 26 years old, and he was a combat engineer in the Army. A combat engineer, and as Martha Raddus reported earlier, anyone with that kind of background would have a certain amount of training of walking into that terminal there today. You've been looking at pictures here all afternoon. There were uh, initial reports 
that there could have been other incidents at the airport, which is just explains why we saw some of the frantic scenes like the one you're looking at right now. Authorities moments ago in that briefing were able to knock down the notion that there was anything else that happened at the airport other than the, the, the terror that unfolded inside Terminal 2. Now, uh, interrogating him right now as we speak, it's a combined uh, effort between local authorities and the FBI. Uh, perhaps one of the most chilling images that we have seen out the window of the terminal and could see uh, someone who was in that terminal taken outside. Uh, this is the image right here. And unfortunately, we, we simply do not know who that person is. He did say uh, they appeared to be alive when they were taken outside. Uh, authorities in this case rushed to get to everyone so quickly, uh, getting that suspect into custody. They're now questioning him at this hour. Eight people at the hospital, five dead on the scene. We will continue. Uh, to report on this throughout the evening. We'll have team coverage coming up on World News Tonight, a special edition at 6.30 Eastern. In the meantime, for many of you, your local news with team coverage coming up on this uh, horrific situation in Fort Lauderdale. Good day. This has been a special report from ABC News. Today, you've been eating healthy all week long, and you deserve a break. It's the Choose Ultimate Choose. Baking up a delicious treat to celebrate Clinton's brand new book. And Mario's spilling his money-saving shopping secrets. Get ready to cheat. <laughs> As you probably know, we are already six days into the new year, and we have been working so hard on those resolutions oh. to eat healthy and shed those pounds, so but we hard. all know that the key to staying on diet is allowing yourself to indulge every once in a while. So get ready, because today is... Cheat Day! Yes, it is Cheat Day! All hour long, we're making <laughs> decadent dishes that'll satisfy your biggest cravings, because you deserve it. <laughs> Yay. For this weekend coming up, what are you guys doing? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm going for a weekend of cheat. Oh, a weekend of cheat? I'm going to the Big Easy tonight. Are you? Oh. Dinner with Donald Link and Steven Strajewski to fund their magnificent inner city culinary arts program in New Orleans and having a blast. <laughs> Tomorrow night, Dr. John is playing. We're watching music. A bunch of chefs also coming to town. We play a little golf. We eat some oysters. We drink a hurricane. <laughs> That's good. Just a little something, something a little. I feel really good right now. <laughs> I'm going over. To, I'll be home in Cleveland all weekend, and it's it's a gonna, it's a very exciting uh, weekend home for me, MB. Do you why know is why? That? What's going on? Because the regular season for football is over, so I don't have to suffer on Sunday anymore. <laughs> Hold on. Watching the Browns. You guys pulled out two games in the last one. Week. Well, we, we almost won. One? Yeah, we. Uh, we only won one. We almost beat the Steelers at the very end, and then fumbled on the three yards. But it's victory. okay. The Cavs. The Cavs season has started. Everything is right with the world. Thanks. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go home to DC and okay. just chill. Probably Chilling binge up. watch something. Good, yeah. You know, yeah. Ooh, what's your binge I'm, watch right now, Carla? What is your binge watch? Oh, I need I, a good binge. I, well, um, The Night Manager I did. And then I did. Um, shoot. <clears throat> what's Katie Strickland's new show? Uh, shut up. Shut down. Shut. Shut up. I? Shut I. Shut I? <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's shut, the shutdown. The shutdown. Shut down. It's shut down? No. Shut eye. Shut eye. Shut eye. That looks shut interesting. Eye. I said to me. shut eye. You, you were right. Shut eye. Okay. I want to watch that's, that one. That's on my list. All that's right. on my list. Uh, what are you doing? I'm taking it easy on Saturday because on Sunday I start my book tour. Oh my gosh. That's right. Oh. Oh. I got a crazy week coming up. I'm going to be um, in uh, Connecticut on uh, Sunday, and then I'm doing a live signing on Sunday night, a virtual signing from my <gasps> apartment. And then I'm in New Jersey, and Austin, Texas, and Phoenix, and uh, Chicago twice. And your box is on. Buy my book. I'll no. It's, it's, it's awesome. exciting, right? So you do that for your next book. So, I will. Um, do, would you so guys, much to learn. So much to learn. Would you guys like to dig into uh, Carla's fried pimento cheese sticks, the ultimate oh. indulgence? Cheating. The recipe for this is on thechew.com, by the way. Do you remember when you made this? It was back in April of 2016. Oh, Fine, yeah. Oh, this is, this is oh, right, right. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, no, yes. This, <laughs> before you even taste it, you can feel the indulgence in this. This mm. seems a little dirty to me. Oh. This is oh. really good, Carla good Hall. Good stuff, Carla Hall. Mm. Mm. 
All right, so as we mentioned, oh, no. it is Friday, so it's time for our weekend oh, menu that's perfect for any cheat day. We have Carlos Fried Pimento Cheese Sticks that we've been digging in his bag. And we have, we've printed out the TSA standard on this because it may seem shocking to people mm -hmm. that you can actually legally carry. check a gun. You can mm -hmm. check TSA, a gun, yeah. but you really can. And according to the rules, you may transport unloaded firearms in a locked, hard sided container only. You have to declare the firearm and any ammunition to the airline at the check-in counter. Now that part will be interesting to see if he actually did. Whether or not people can go to the airport, as we talked about, all flights, uh, all operations have been suspended as of now at the airport. And Arginis Fernandez is looking into the traffic situation surrounding the airport because no one is being allowed in, or at least at one point that was the case. Has that changed, uh, Janice? Alvin, the off-ramp is still closed. This is 595 eastbound as you're approaching the airport. And unfortunately, that's causing a lot of delays. We're seeing delays stretch onto I-95. And we're also told that the ramps are closed for police activity. Bound I've, and also a heavy police presence on US-1, both northbound and southbound, as you are approaching the airport. We are also seeing delays out of Port Everglades as well. Traffic is being let out of Port Everglades, but unfortunately, for anyone who may be trying to enter Port Everglades, that situation is just not going to happen. They're not letting any cars through. So as you can imagine, this is causing very big traffic backups areas you'll want to avoid. So just to give you some quick alternates before I send it back to you, State Road 84, your alternate for 595. As far as I-95, stick to the turnpike, maybe US 441 instead. And Janice, you want to add to all those traffic warnings, the airline warnings. Of course, you have to check with your airline and nothing is moving at Fort Lauderdale. But American Airlines just confirming to us that all of them, at least you can get out of MIA where their hub is. But just know that, unfortunately, all American Airlines flights are canceled for today. And, and, and the Fort Lauderdale International, Hollywood International Airport director at the news conference a few minutes ago said the airport will be closed until it is, quote, deemed safe. safe. And all the passengers, and there appear to be a few thousand of them, I think, at the airport, yeah. are, quote, sheltering in place, in place, which means they're not being allowed to leave. We did get a little BSO was allowing a cars to leave That's the right. airport no, now, and that was our right. first sign of normalcy. But they are being searched thoroughly. The drivers are being checked. A few cars have been allowed to leave oh, the airport, but we have not physically seen that from yeah. Sky 10. Absolutely. And law enforcement taking no chances. Our Andrew Perez has been following that angle for you and has been watching uh, what's been happening at the airport as well. Andrew, uh, we'll send it over to you. Airport, all the different agencies that are here around the airport trying to keep order. A lot of those passengers that ran out to the tarmac or that were already on the tarmac, they went across and take shelter. All of a sudden, I see a giant convoy of uh, law enforcement heading toward the airport. So I followed them and I saw them trying to get everybody to run, to run, to run, to try to get out of the airport. I was talking to some of the women uh, who were running out. They said that they were told they had to leave their bags behind out. They said it was a little bit chaotic because people didn't know what was going on. But what I thought was interesting was that several people who I was speaking with said that they were already watching this shooting unfold on TV. They were watching the news inside the airport. According to a lot of the passengers that I've spoken to out here on the outskirts of the airport, I'm right off Southwest 33rd Court and Southwest 2nd Avenue, which is right next to the 595 open. They decided to run to an emergency exit, get outside, and then run toward the fence to seek shelter. Then once they got out here, I arrived and I look up on the 595 overpass. I see one man who, in a white shirt. Police stopped him. They had their guns pointed at him. He had his hands up on the overpass outside of his car, and they told him to turn around. They told him to start walking backwards. It was a very, very uh, meticulous process. It took a, a while to get that man. They cuffed him and presumably they're questioning him now. Now, we do understand that police have also been going around the airport stopping people who fit a certain description, uh, stopping people who are acting suspiciously because, again, like the sheriff said, it's a very fluid situation. They're trying to get a hold of it. The situation right now, a lot of the people are waiting. They don't have their phones. Some of them don't have their luggage. They're waiting on the outskirts of the airport in some of these warehouses to, to see where they go from here. Uh, a lot of them were supposed to catch flights, and, and right now it's just a, a wait-and-see situation while police uh, continue to secure this area.
Okay, and talk about this being a wait-and-see situation. Lori just mentioned that American Airlines is uh, shutting down its service terminal. Reports all American flights into FLL have been canceled for today. And it is just so far. My own husband is on a flight, sitting right there on a Southwest flight. He told me, I mean, this, the flight attendants throughout this afternoon, at one point, they were told about the second possible shooter and that panicked everyone on the plane but we know now from the sheriff there was not a second incident but at this point they were doing a land service to the plane and hopefully crews are out there servicing a lot of those planes now they're emptying the bathroom tanks trying to get water to these people wow. but it is a miserable situation and we're all getting texts from friends who are just sitting on airplanes yeah, yeah. there with hungry children and it is not a good situation these might michael be our first actual passengers who are walking out of the airport. It is, it is hard to know, but in fact, I believe that that is the underpass on US-1 uh, over the new, that is the new runway above it. And I believe that that is Eric Yetzi, who is at that scene. He's heading and, toward Griffin Road. Yeah, yes, and right. Lori says we see uh, these people, this couple being searched and they're walking. Uh, what is going on there? Well, you're exactly right on the location, Michael. This is US-1. That is, is that, that overpass. The runway is above. And so what you are seeing is this couple being questioned by police. This is the second checkpoint that anyone who comes through that overpass is going through. You may have seen the live pictures, that gentleman in the green shirt walking with his hands. Hollywood police there. Many of them have long asked to walk slowly with their hands in the air. They are searched and checked initially there at the second group right here. And that is where they are asked questions, presumably about what they saw, where they're, where they're going, where they're coming from. And so this may be the first set of passengers we have really seen. We have seen several airport workers come through. We have seen construction workers come through. And in the background, here comes one of those heavy armored uh, SWAT vehicles that is passing through right now and so come passing through. And when vehicles come passing through, they go through a similar double screening. They are stopped there and then they are stopped again right here by this second checkpoint. And that's where people are asked to step out. The vehicle is searched. So a very active search scene. Again, we are at US-1 and Griffin Road and Peru perimeter road, by the way, is still shut down. So we're going to talk to these individuals here. Here they come. We're going to talk to them in just a moment. We'll get their story and bring it to you just a few minutes away. All right, Eric, thank you. We'll check back. We do want to share some other information for you. According to the Army Criminal Investigation Division, or what's called the CID for the Army, this shooter, Esteban Santiago, was honorably discharged from the Army National Guard in 2016. So let's just assume for a moment that that was the very end, maybe just the Military National Guard. So if he had just been discharged, possibly still had some form of ID, and he declared his say and had the ammunition, you know, also there mm -hmm. in the in the baggage that he checked that is completely legal in our airline system. And, and, and I think the uh, best information in terms of a description of what may have happened earlier today with uh, the alleged gunman there, Mr. Santiago, is that the shooter was a passenger on a Canadian flight. This coming from Chip Lamarca, the Broward County, uh, Broward County Commissioner for District 4. He says he uh, had a uh, gun on with, uh, with his, no, had a checked gun is what he said. He claimed his bag and took the bag from baggage claim and went into the bathroom to load it, came out shooting people in baggage claim. And we heard from the SO Sheriff Scott Israel right. that 13 people were shot, five dead, eight transported to Broward Health Medical Center. And Sonella was right there when that news conference was going on, our Sonella Sabovic. Let's go back to her now and get uh, the latest information from her. Sonella. Calvin, at that news conference, Broward Sheriff Scott Israel said that it's a fluid and active situation. He did mention that SWAT teams are securing the entire airport. We did see some coming in and out of Terminal 2. I did get a chance to speak to an officer from Customs and Border Patrol. He told me that they were sweeping Terminals 1, 2, 3, and 4. I believe one has been declared safe, but again, movement coming out of Terminal 2 right now. We are in between Terminals 1 and 2, and I'm standing with a passenger who came after the initial shooting. Sir, tell us what airport officials told you after that first shooting happened. Uh, well, they said it was it was fine. Everything was safe. We were in Terminal 1, a United Terminal, checked our bags, and we were staying around. Our flight's not until 7 o'clock, and then we heard four shots inside that terminal. Bang, 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 bang. People started running for their lives. I got separated from my wife and my daughters. They were hiding right here. My son took off the other way. I was over here behind a taxi, a woman with a baby and a stroller were hiding right there too. 
I went back into Terminal 1 to look for them. It was back out, found them, and then we moved down this way. But people were running every way you could. Very now, nice. we, we do want to make it clear that Sheriff Scott Israel said that there was no second shooting that took place here. They were sweeping the garage right. area. But when you thought there was a second shooting situation, what were you being told? Nothing. Nobody told us anything. We ran. We heard. I, uh, I've heard shots before. I'm from Chicago. So it was like bam, 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 bam. And everybody ran. Not a few people. Everybody ran out of that terminal in force and ran for their lives. United Terminal, right there. That's where the upper level baggage. Is. In fact, that's where our suitcases are. They're right there. So whatever terminal that is, which I think is Terminal One, that's where I heard the shots. Terminal One, and you're. They're trying to get back in and get them. They're right there in the middle of the terminal because we couldn't even check them because our flight's not till seven. Thank you, sir, for speaking to us again. Uh, Greg Meyer with Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport did tell us that the airport is closed until further notice. No flights are coming in. None are leaving here until the airport is declared safe. Broward Sheriff Scott Israel did mention that that they are now that SWAT teams are scouring the entire area. Again, no movement in and out of the airport. Now, the shooting did take place around one o'clock at Terminal 2, which we're standing right next to downstairs in that baggage area. That shooter was taken into custody, he told us saying that he's unharmed. He's currently being interviewed by FBI agents in Broward BSO. Now there is, again, we initially thought that there was a second shooting situation when dozens of FBI officers, BSO officers, Fort Lauderdale uh, police officer, they immediately made a dash to that parking garage near a rental car area. But again, they were sweeping the entire garage. They have since cleared it right now, but there was no second shooting situation, no active second shooter. Again, they are going through terminals right Sanella, now to make sure everything is moment. safe. One moment, Sanella. We actually are able to be joined right now by Sheriff Scott Israel from Broward Sheriff's Office. Sheriff, thank you for your time on this chaotic day. Yes, uh, you're, you're can you hear me well? We can. Sheriff, you have Lori Jennings, Calvin no, Cruz, and Michael no. Putney right here. Airport Sheriff, we will be here for your entire uh, press conference, but uh, please bring us up to date now. Can you identify any of the victims for us? Are, can you at least tell us if they're from South Florida? Uh, yeah, here's where we're at. Um, we have um, uh, 13 people shot in Terminal 2 uh, just before 1 o'clock. Um, eight of the victims are being treated at area hospital. I don't know the extent of their injuries. Uh, five people have succumbed to their wounds and have, and have died uh, based on this horrific attack. Uh, we have the shooter in custody. We believe at this time it was one person. We had no, no reason to believe that it was uh, any type of conspiracy. Uh, the, the being interviewed by Broward Sheriff's detectives and the FBI together. We're not releasing any information on any of the uh, victims until we could positively identify them and notify the next to kin in, in a dignified, professional manner. Uh, and I'm sure if you have any questions for me. But Sheriff, would you, are you allowed to tell us, can you tell us yet, if any of those victims are from our community? I really, I really, I really don't know. You know, so many uh, people I, are panicked at home right now, and especially people. I know I'm lucky right. to be able to communicate with my husband well, for people and, who and can't. I, and, and, I, and I understand, and I understand that, and I, and I feel for that anguish and what happens. But uh, we want to positively identify the victims. Um, we want to make sure the next kin is notified. Uh, you know, by our detectives in, in, a, in a, you know, in a, in a, you know, so we're going to handle the justice way. Uh, we understand that the uh, information is, you know, is needed, uh, you know, for the media. We want to get it out as quick as possible, but we want to make sure we keep Broward County safe. And right now, uh, the, the most of our assets and resources are safe for citizens and residents to come back and forth and, and to reopen the airport. Uh, Sheriff Israel, it's Michael Putney. We're very glad that you're joining us. Sheriff, I know that uh, you, the BSO, is really staffed up at Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport. Uh, there is a very large time. Um, how long was it between the shooting and the capture of uh, Esteban Santiago? It sounds like it didn't uh, take long. Yeah, M Michael, that's a great question. Uh, I was told it was approximately 30 to 40 seconds uh, when our deputies uh, heard the gunshots and they, and they turned. They encountered the suspect. The suspect dropped his weapon. The suspect was taken into custody without incident. 
Uh, there were no shots fired by Broward uh, Sheriff's deputies, and the subject is at an undisclosed place at the airport right now being interviewed by the Broward Sheriff's Office and the FBI. All right, you may not be able to tell us, but in, did he say anything to your deputies? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. And, and is there any feeling, uh, Sheriff Israel, that this might be an act of terror or it could be something else? It, 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 uh, at, this, at this point, uh, Michael, it, it should really be anything, I would say, based on the knowledge I have at this time. It would be a homegrown violent extremist. Uh, and I believe that the, uh, you know, once we, we sift through uh, some of the information that our detectives are looking at right now, that the FBI will be taking the lead on this investigation and, uh, you know, we'll be assisting the FBI, the FBI in, the, in the investigation of the aftermath. So, 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 Sheriff, what does that mean? Uh, I'm not talking about the suspects. We're not sure. We're putting at a, 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 term, a term of a person who we have no reason to believe has been part of al-Qaeda or been associated with ISIS or, or, or any terrorist groups, but they may follow them on, uh, on media, social media. Uh, they may uh, be uh, sympathizers of this group. They may want to be part of the group, and they may want to do something violent to uh, bring attention to the group. And, Sheriff, you described within 30 to 40 seconds this gunman shooting at least 13 people. Can you tell us what kind of weapon he had? I can't tell you that at this time, Lori. We're not releasing that information. So, so you have no reason to believe at this point that, uh, that the suspect now in custody was a part of some sort of organized terrorist group such as ISIS? That's exactly no information at this time to be able to uh, substantiate that correct help. But he may have followed them online. You don't know if this was <clears throat> right. in any and way that, in relation and that's really to... that's the focus of the investigation right now. And that's why the FBI is going to be taking over this investigation. So it is yeah, possibly terrorism-related. Exactly, is you know, that fair we, to say? Exactly. And we're, we're as we speak, uh, the, the detectives and the federal agents are interviewing. Uh, so a possible terrorist act from a person who was not in the group ISIS, was not a member of the group ISIS, but may have followed them online and may have been, in fact, influenced by their teachings. Is that fair to say to report? That's very fair to say. Very fair to say. Sheriff Israel, uh, we are very grateful for you joining us. We know it's a, a chaotic and intense afternoon. Uh, if I may, I want to invite you to come Sunday morning and appear on This Week in South Florida and to speak uh, by that time, 1130 on Sunday, you will know a lot more. We'd love to have you come in. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, you know, uh, just, uh, it's time for Broward County to play for identified in the Some prayers going on in the terminal, and that was a beautiful sight, because that's about all people can do right now is really pray for those victims. And in, vein, in that vein, Sheriff, we've heard the Terminal 1 is safe. Can you verify that? Term yeah, term Terminal 1 is safe. It was a, a, a very minor incident. Absolutely not associated. Thanks for bringing that up. Not associated with Terminal Two. Uh, it's it's been handled. It's gone. There've been no other identified threats anywhere uh, on the airport, but but at Terminal Two. Um, and uh, if you did, you know, uh, when you speak to the public or on you know one one lines as open as they can, uh, we're getting hammered. Uh, and if it's if they have an emergency somewhere else in Broward County. Uh, certainly call my airport on lockdown, and we don't really need any 911 calls about the airport. And, and Sheriff Israel, if I can ask you about more of a police and tactical move here, why are we seeing people walk down the street with their hands up? And we have seen this happening for the last hour or two, as people have been on the tarmac and have been coming out of the terminals. Why is that necessary? You brought that, it, it's so loud. Can you try that one more time? I I said, really why why, why are we seeing people walking out of the terminals and out of the parking garages with their hands up? Well, uh, we have a, a Broward Sheriff SWAT team and, and, and various local SWAT teams helping us out, and we're clearing the airport. We don't know, uh, you know, uh, what's a threat and what's not a threat. So uh, I just want to, uh, I'm sure that they want to make things safe for themselves and certainly safe quick matter. They want to see people's hands. Uh, and then once they get people to safety, I'm sure they'll talk to them and allow the people to go their own, their own, their own way tactically. But you, you certainly, when you clear any area, you want to see people's hands. And Sheriff, we were just looking live as some people with luggage were just literally walking their way all the way to US-1 around the Griffin Road area, and then they'll be searched there. We're looking at that live picture on the left. We see a family walking out. Is that about the only way you're going to get out of the airport at this point? 
Um, you know, Lori, I, I really don't know. All I can tell you is uh, the airport director, uh, you know, correctly closed the airport. What is clear, uh, my, you know, my main concern, uh, you know, obviously I don't want to see people, uh, you know, not being able to get ingress and ingress to where they need to go. But that's not even you know, uh, on my top ten list of, of concerns right now. I want this Broward County safe. And when people can come here and I'm not worried about any active shooters or any safety issues, that's going to open the airport. And we are waiting to hear from you that those other terminals are safe and you can reopen the airport. And Sheriff Israel, as soon as you get more information about the victims, please do share it with us. Five people yes. dead. Oh, yes. Yep. Thanks for having me on. Take care. All right, Sheriff Israel, thanks a lot. I think the uh, headline for what that conversation was about clearly is that this is a homegrown violent extremist was not in the, the group I off with their teachings and tea online. Yeah, well, the sheriff did say it's going to be a purely criminal act. It would be BSO taking right. the lead. It's going to be FBI. And I thought is that within 30 to 40 seconds of this shooting that the BSO deputies had already taken the guy into custody. Um, he did not put up any kind of resistance. And some witnesses, we heard the um, airport pilot there, the airplane pilot describing just a handgun, a set unheard of by any means. And then that suspect, according to the sheriff, dropped his weapon and was taken in without incident by his officers. Hmm. You're looking live now on the right side of your screen. This is the scene where we started to see the construction workers coming out first, and now we're seeing passengers, entire families coming out, some with luggage, they for stranded people to get out of the airport. There you see a mom with her one backpack, two small children. They have to feel so relieved. They're walking toward Griffin Road, and that is where a lot of taxis and Ubers are probably going to start loading up, US-1 and Griffin. And, and the, uh, you know, Mark Yale, the airport director, talked about how the all operations have been suspended at the airport, so people are sheltered in place like planes are on the tarmac on the runway. As the young people come out with their hands up, uh, that no one else has been involved in this incident or is going to possibly be involved in the incident, but the gunman uh, remains in custody and is now being interviewed by the FBI. At an undisclosed, all luggage carts uh, sneaking around on the right and then straight ahead on the right. Uh, but there appear to be a couple of hundred uh, passengers who are still out on the tarmac. Uh, I mean, what, uh, what an ordeal wow. for these people. Wow. A lot of people are probably thinking they will never see their luggage again, yeah. or you know, they'll just have to walk away from a lot of belongings, but they are walking away with their lives. Five people are not, and we know another eight are fighting for their lives in the hospital tonight. We can only hope they pull should say at 4th, we are following this breaking news for you, attack at the airport. A gunman opening fire in the baggage claim earlier this afternoon. And here's what we know so far. Five people have been killed. Eight others were injured. The shooting suspect has been identified. Esteban Santiago, 26 years old, former military. He was honorably discharged from the Army in 2016. And at this point, we do know again his age, 26, and the Broward Sheriff's Office says he did not put up a fight when he was arrested. We've also confirmed that he flew from Anchorage, Alaska to Minneapolis and then on to Fort Lauderdale. And the shooting happened in Terminal 2 in the Vegas claim area. And officials say that Santiago allegedly took his weapon out of his checked luggage, went to the bathroom to load it up, and then went back to baggage claim before opening fire. All airport operations, we've been discussing that, they have been suspended while this investigation is underway. We and, know Terminal mm -hmm. 1 is safe, That's but right. there are others to be cleared. Yeah, Terminals 2, 3, and 4 are still being investigated right now, and BSO and the FBI looking into reports of a second shooter, but they say no evidence was found. Shots being fired. And now this, Facebook letting its users in South Florida let their friends and contacts know that they are okay with this safety check. It is up live right now for you on Facebook. Look for Facebook Safety Check. And reporters all across the airport, as well as uh, our Michael Putney and, of course, Lori Jennings and Calvin Hughes here. Uh, changer uh, in so many ways for people who travel in and out of South Florida. I think for anybody who ever, whether you have, I mean, Lori, your husband is caught up in this because he's on a flight that he who flew yeah. and and having this kind of uh, violence, uh, this 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 fusillade mm -hmm. of gunfire yeah. from a it appears to be a sociopath, an angry man. Uh, who may have been some state or jihadism uh, taking this gun, which he checked legally uh, when he got on the plane in Anchorage. You have to, TSA and Lori got the regulations. It has to be, I wonder, where out of the luggage, go into the bathroom, 
and just load it up and then come out and start blasting people. And this TSA screening will certainly be questioned because you are allowed to have an unloaded firearm in a locked hard-sided container as long as you declare that firearm and the ammunition to the airline. And we talked about a team of reporters being fanned out all across the airport to cover the story for you. Let's begin with our Jeff Weinseer, live now at the airport with more. Jeff. It has happened again in our staging area between Terminal 2 and 3. People are now running towards Terminal 2, towards the people are ducking. It is just Terminal 3. And we are in a staging area. This is a staging area where most people were brought and searched. And this is where they have been sitting. Frustrated passengers, people who don't know what their next move is next, people who left luggage. But again, as you just talked to me, about 100 people. We did not hear any bangs. Now police are coming out of Terminal 2 and pushing everybody back. People are there with their hands up to show. People are pointing that way. Law enforcement's going that way. But again, very chaotic scene. Now you have police officers running towards Terminal 3, and then you have another officer telling them to calm down, calm down, nothing's going on. So Michael talked about nerves. Michael talked about how people are not the secure right now between Terminal 2 and Terminal 3, where people are yeah. hugging each other, people are in tears, uh, where people just don't know uh, how long we are going to be here. Uh, we are 50 yards from that crime scene. We are 50 yards uh, from the baggage claim area, Terminal 2, that houses Air Canada and Delta. It happened on the west side of any Terminal 3, waiting for the next direction as to what we do. Uh, earlier, we saw them, uh, they were not only searching all of us here, but they were searching cars uh, in the parking lot. Uh, they were, uh, we now see Homeland Security just pulled up. Um, the FBI on the scene, uh, the sheriff's office is, is doing an amazing job under the circumstances. But a very tense area between Terminal 2 and Terminal 2 from Terminal 3, the staging area, and we're trying to figure out why. And I have to say, Jeff, even though <clears throat> as a reporter, uh, and you've been one for a while, me too, Calvin and Lori as well, uh, it's not every day that you yourself get patted down and searched by police when you are out on the job, but indeed that happened to you and your photographer uh, about an hour and a half ago when you were in the garage. Well, Michael, patted down and searched between, uh, uh, to be honest with you, was nothing compared to what we went through to shoot or we were between the garage in Terminal 2, when all of a sudden 35 to 50 police officers with guns drawn came at us, told us to get down. That was a very chaotic scene. The police officers were getting down. They were falling on the ground. That's when we believed that there was a second shooter. Uh, that turned out to be false, but in this stuff after the fact all the time. But we were here. We were in the middle of it. And even right now, we want to bring you pictures from witnesses. We want to bring you witnesses, what they heard, what they saw, but we can't. We are with the general public now between Terminal 2 and 3 with no live capability. The crew members, and we are with uh, the ops people who work on the airport, and we are in a staging area, and we, are, we cannot move. And we know you're getting a lot of questions from them, Jeff. Sometimes for passengers, we in the media, they, they know that we may have more information, and we know they're looking to you, so do stay safe. We thought was something was actually someone who was injured exactly. during evacuation, and that hopefully is what is happening now as you see this rush of officers, someone maybe having an injury and or speaking. Lori, real quick, reacting. I'm getting some information. Yes. You know, the funny thing is, when you talk to me, people were just running, running in fear towards Terminal 2 from this area. I'm looking at shoes, empty shoes. Somebody oh. ran into each other like, why did this point be? But everybody here, to say they're on edge, is putting it lightly. Kind of a herd reaction happens very, very quickly. And we hope we can allay some fears. But, and we know, know you can, Jeff. So we will all keep each other informed and try to get our community through this, especially the thousands of people who are trapped there at the airport along with you. Yeah, sheer terror running rampant through the airport there. And it's hard to believe that we're even talking about about you think about the history of the last 20 years or so in this country, you think about somebody like Timoth Timothy McVeigh, who blew up the, uh, the Murrah office, federal office building in Oklahoma City. Um, so these things in your community, it just changes your perspective. Absolutely. And we know we are such a major thoroughfare to the rest of the world, That's especially right. to South America and to Europe, Miami and Fort Lauderdale growing just by leaps and bounds. And this is a sign of the times.
there we see uh, what happened earlier. Todd Tongan was describing to us uh, a rabbi that came out and was leading some folks in prayer. Let's join him now and see what's been going on there now. Todd, tell us where you are positioned right now. Of Terminal 1, and I was a little surprised to hear on the coverage that Sheriff Israel said after he said that, uh, D to 60 FBI SWAT agents in full gear with automatic weapons came through the terminal and it patted down each and every one of us and then told us all to line up on the conveyor belt and sit down and we remain there. We've been here for a little over an hour. Luckily, the Red Cross did show up and handed out some water and some food, but to say that people are um, on edge and frustrated and tired and concerned and confused would be putting it very lightly. They are even escorting people to the bathroom at the bathrooms on their own. So I'm not sure what Sheriff Israel uh, heard from his officers, but FBI SWAT has Terminal 1 on complete lockdown. And the announcements keep coming over the loudspeaker saying the airport is on lockdown. Everybody stay where you are and stay secure. Certainly a lot scarier than what it felt like in that parking garage when there was a thought there was a second shooter and we were inside the garage as the dozens and dozens of SWAT members stormed into the garage and actually pointed their weapons at us, told us to get down, and then once they realized that we were not a threat, they uh, continued to sweep that garage, having everybody put their arms in the air and file out of the garage, and they pushed us um, are not able to get out live with uh, our camera gear because we're not able to access our equipment, which is in the park. Uh, very different from Terminal 1, but as you're standing there, you're seeing it firsthand in real time that it is still on lockdown as we speak. And, Michael, we have some new information coming from uh, Air Canada here that we find most interesting here. It says, we confirm that we have no record of such a passenger, Esteban Santiago, by that name, or checked guns on any of our flights to Fort Lauderdale. An interesting twist in this investigation, but always we are getting a number of accounts from different sources. Well, Air Canada certainly, um, we know they fly from Montreal and Toronto and uh, uh, Calgary and other great cities in Canada, but uh, they also fly from Minneapolis. And uh, I, I think maybe Janice Fernandez can check and see if uh, when that flight left Minneapolis and flew into Fort Lauderdale and we got a flight number, uh, and see if indeed we can sort of identify the flight that uh, Santiago was on. Well, Michael, this is where um, I'm sort of having trouble with, to be quite honest, because as I looked first at the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International uh, Airport's website, we did see those. However, as I filter through by city from the website and I type in Minneapolis, the only airline I'm getting is actually a Delta Airlines flight that flew from Minneapolis and there was one that flew earlier this morning, one that came in this afternoon. We did hear the Broward Sheriff's Office though mention that the flight was a Canadian flight. So of course our assumption was it must have been Air Canada. That is the airline that flies in and out of Fort Lauderdale. And obviously if you're like you mentioned, if you're flying to Canada, that's the airline you take from the airport. But when I search on the website, no reports of that. Obviously Air Canada saying no record of this passenger. The only flight that originated from Minneapolis that I'm seeing from the website is a Delta Airlines flight. There were two. One landed later in the afternoon at 3 o'clock. The other landed earlier this morning. So we're still trying to figure this out. We're still trying to figure out which flight he was on. What's a uh, big question? Why did he do this? What was the motive beh behind this shooting? And of course, he was in the baggage claim at the Delta baggage claim. So that may be indeed the airline he was on from Minnesota to Fort Lauderdale. Janice, thank you for working that for us. And I wanted to ask you also, Janice, would you be able to share with everyone some of the information on the, um, the new phone numbers and information from the Broward Sheriff's Office, if you have that information there? Yeah. Yes. Um, because they're really trying to reach out. They do not want people calling 911. They're just being flooded, but they are setting up these other phone numbers. Yes, absolutely. Broward Sheriff on their Twitter account posting, again, do not call 911. They don't have any information. Information. So if you're trying to call, you have questions or concerns about the shooting, you are asked to call 954-831-4000.
or 31 wooding this hotline trying to get information about their loved ones and also trying to get information in general about where they could possibly pick up their loved ones I'm going to give you that number one more time again it is 954-831-4000 or 311 again do not call 911 and be patient if you are trying to reach that hotline Okay. Thank you, Janice. They also emphasize to check their Twitter page. It's Twitter at FLL Flyer, and that will bring you all breaking news updates. We know that all American Airlines flights have been canceled. They will change your flight for no fee, but don't even think of getting out of Fort Lauderdale or getting into Fort Lauderdale on American Airlines tonight. We have learned a lot more about the shooter, and uh, we have not learned a lot about the victims who were a part of this uh, tragic act by this this lone gunman, but uh, we have learned that the shooter possibly was a homegrown violent extremist influenced by possibly the teachings of ISIS or other terrorist material possibly online. Let's go now to our Glenna Milberg who is following this angle of the story that is so intriguing for us right now because there's a lot that we don't know. Glenna, what have you learned from your research? Absolutely one line of uh, detective work. We do know that I can say confidently that when the FBI joins an investigation, there is absolutely going to be a very careful look into whether this is terror-related, whether it's terror-related with a connection somewhere else, whether it is a lone wolf, uh, whether it's somebody who was influenced, even in his own mind, influenced by terror-related act related activities. That is absolutely one part of what is very preliminary at this point. And, of course, we've seen our share of those kinds of investigations over the year. We had the young man in Key West and a young man in Miami over the course of the last year. That's one side of the story. I can tell you a couple of things that we have verified about Esteban Santiago uh, that we do know factually, and this will all be part of piecing together with and what led him, presumably, to be in Terminal 2 with that gun shooting earlier this afternoon. We do know that he has had past addresses in Penuelos, Puerto Rico, also in Anchorage, Alaska, in the last year. He actually lived in Anchorage from 2014 to 2016. Now, he had an active military ID with him, uh, and we understand from the um, ABC affiliates that have been checking his military background that he was uh, in the Army National Guard in 2016 and was honorably discharged. He was a combat engineer, got an honorable discharge sometime over the last year. Now that comes, that date comes into play in an interesting way. We found that Santiago had opened, and he was doing anchors that had been dismissed. One of them was an assault. The sentencing for this criminal mischief charge was delayed uh, until this March. It was delayed last year, right around the time it appears that he was honorably discharged from the Army National Guard. So it is very likely that is where he was stationed. We do know he was born in New Jersey. We do know that he has uh, a couple of addresses in Florida that he's lived also, I mentioned, in Puerto Rico. And uh, right now... We okay, Glenna, we're going to check back in with you. Okay, and investigators are also looking into claims, according to CNN, that the suspect and this shooting got into some sort of fight or altercation on board the flight prior to landing. And he apparently left a bag of some sort on the north side of the airport. That bag is being detonated as we speak. We've been looking from Sky 10 to try to capture that scene for you, but that is possibly an area we can't even fly near because of the other FBI and, and federal ch helicopters that are in the Santiago on the north side of the airport. Uh, we are going to get a very quick check on the forecast for you in a moment here with our meteorologist, Betty Davis. And uh, yeah. Betty, uh, we have you here right now so we can get a check right, uh, just before the top of the hour. We have 11 minutes. Go ahead. Hey guys, it is our Fort Lauderdale Tower camera. Not incredibly comfortable for all the people still waiting out there, but not oppressively humid either. Currently 78 out at FLL, 79 in Miami. Factor in the humidity, it feels like 80 in Fort Lauderdale. So it's a warm afternoon. From time to time, we have seen a few raindrops, a few sprinkles coming through, and we can't rule out a little shower action trying to pass things. But for the most part, it's just a few clouds in some of your neighborhoods. So here's the forecast.
between now and 8 p.m. tonight. We'll keep that chance for a shower in there, but I'm not thinking widespread rain for the early evening. Some clouds around tonight by 8 o'clock. Temperatures dropping off into the mid 70s. The big story for the weekend will be an approach through on Saturday, and it holds a big temperature change behind it. Notice this forecast model showing that by 2 p.m.